Today on PGTV News, Governor DeSantis has outlined a plan on reopening Florida's economy. We have the details on what that means for Polk County. And the Polk County School Board has approved a new contract. How will that affect teachers? That's ahead on PGTV News. Welcome to PGTV News. I'm Tina Mann. And I'm Stephen Barnes. This week, Governor Ron DeSantis announced that Florida will start reopening in baby steps with different regions reopening at different times and rates. Florida's restaurants and retail stores will be allowed to reopen at 25% capacity if the local government allows it. The governor specifically excluded hard-hit, heavily populated Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach counties, saying their businesses will begin phase one when it is safer. His order will also allow hospitals and surgical centers statewide to restart non-essential elective procedures, but only if they have sufficient medical supplies and agree to help nursing homes and assisted living facilities prevent and respond to the coronavirus outbreaks. Parks, golf courses, and other outdoor recreation areas already began reopening in some counties. The DeSantis Task Force also suggested reopening gyms and barbershops with restrictions, but the governor is not allowing that in the first phase. DeSantis is also not setting a date for the second phase. Instead, he's taking a wait and see approach to how the state fares during the first phase. Bars and nightclubs also won't reopen yet, but DeSantis gave approval to sporting events if they don't include spectators. The state will continue to restrict visitors to nursing homes and state prisons. The State Police Chiefs Association last week warned against a regional approach to reopening and called for a statewide plan telling the task force its members fear Floridians would travel to less restrictive areas and potentially overwhelm those areas' law enforcement. Others, including the chief of the state's business licensing division, said a regional approach would be preferable. Florida Democrats criticized DeSantis' handling of the crisis, saying he stacked his task force with business leaders and Republicans. They say he should have included doctors on its executive committee and asked for input from workers. They said DeSantis has been more concerned about the economy than health care. Sounds like there's a whole lot of people with a whole lot of different opinions. Yeah, yeah, there is. Uh, you know, we had the, the opportunity to watch uh, Governor DeSantis's remarks, and, and he laid out a lot of data to begin with that, um, that really show the, that Florida has done a good job in controlling and maintaining the outbreak of the coronavirus. Now, what that means for the future, it's hard to say, um, which I think is, is the big reason why we're going to this, you know, phase phased process. But I was pleased to see that it was a very phased process. Mm -hmm. I, I expected it to be a little bit more broad and, and I was happy to see that it wasn't, that he's really right. keeping everybody and their concerns in line. The city of Winter Haven has already opened some municipal parks and recreational facilities on Friday as part of a phased plan extending to June 12th. The City Commission unanimously approved a reopening plan drawn up by Travis Edwards, Director of the Parks, Recreation and Cultural Department, at its regular meeting last week. The plan opened up 23 facilities on Friday, including the Willowbrook Golf Course and the Te Winter Haven Tennis Center. Also open are most of the municipal boat ramps and parks without the significant playground equipment that would draw large crowds. Parks with playground equipment, such as Lake Ship and Lake Hartridge Nature Parks, will open on May 15th in the second phase of 14 facilities. Also opening that day will be the Birdsong and Tugerson Athletic Fields and the remaining boat ramps at Lakes Ship and Hartridge. The city will open the facilities in both phases for public use, but it will not schedule special events to avoid crowds. The commission will meet again on May 11th before the second phase of reopenings and on May 25th before the third phase. Five of the most popular recreational facilities will open in the third phase on May 29th, including the Rowdy Gaines Pool, the baseball and softball fields at the Diamond Plex facility, and the fields at Chain of Lakes and Sertoma Parks. The pool will open for lap swimming only with use controlled to allow for social distancing. The field will not open for rentals or leagues. The fourth phase on June 5th will include opening six indoor recreation and cultural facilities, 
including the Advent Health Fieldhouse, the Winter Haven Senior Center, and the Public Library. The final phase on June 12th will open the Advent Health Fieldhouse and all municipal facilities for rentals and special events. No decision has been made yet on summer sports leagues. So ramping up on some of the recreational facilities then? Well, it's an ambitious mm -hmm. plan and hopefully we'll continue to see a decline in cases and, yeah. and not have to make changes to these well, plans. Well, the last thing you want to do is wait until the last minute and make you make your plans. I mean, obviously, the county, the cities, the municipalities, they're all making their plans now. Subject to yeah, change. Yeah, subject to change, but better to have and not need than not have and wish you had it. Is that how that goes? I don't think that's how that goes, but you know what I mean. Close map. The Florida Department of Transportation has an updated map for the public to view the toll road planned from Polk County to Collier County. The Southwest Central Florida Connector Task Force met by conference call last week, its first session since a gathering March 4th in Sebring. Most of the presentation by the Florida Department of Transportation officials involved an explanation of new elements on the committee's planning map. The interactive online map had previously allowed users to superimpose tracks highlighted for avoidance such as public lands and environmentally sensitive zones. Task force members learned that planners have added places deemed favorable for a highway site because of existing infrastructure or land use designations. The toll road, expected to cover about 140 miles, is one of three now being planned at the direction of the Florida legislature. Lawmakers passed a bill last year setting up the framework for planning and construction, including the creation of three task forces to guide route planning. The legislation passed identified economic development and hurricane evacuation routes as primary reasons to build the roads, officially known as multi-use corridors of regional economic significance, or MCORs. The legislation ordered the task forces to deliver reports to Governor Ron DeSantis and legislative leaders by October 1st, with construction set to begin by December 31st, 2022. The Florida Department of Transportation officials told the Southwest Central Task Force on Tuesday that their deadline has been pushed back now to November 15th because of the COVID-19 crisis. The interactive map accessible at FloridaMCORS.com now allows users to add layers showing areas and sites in four categories. Three represent avoidance areas or places the planners say the highway will avoid altogether or in which any new construction would only use existing corridors. The toll road projects have generated controversy and many making public comments at past meetings urged the task force to recommend that the Southwest Central Connector not be built at all. Most of those arguments have emphasized the project's environmental harm, but some have also focused on the highway's cost. FDOT officials have said the projects will be funded through tolls from existing roads, future collections, construction bonds, Florida's Turnpike Enterprise revenue bonds, state transportation trust advances, and public-private partnerships. The next meeting is scheduled for June 10th in Punta Gorda. So lots of controversy over new roads, always. Right. Always controversy. But I will say I work very closely with some planners, and they know what they're doing. They yeah. know what they're talking about, and they know what is going to become overwhelming in the future. And it's often the same people who complain about the traffic and congestion that complain right. about pollution. So they have to find a way to bridge mm. between the two. Well, and of course this project started some time ago, but now there's even another added benefit. We know that these types of infrastructure projects are, they help stimulate the economy. They help right. to kind of give a, a jump start and boost some of that, uh, some of that money flowing in and out of the state. Absolutely. Lakeland residents facing difficulty paying their monthly rent can find local help. Lakeland commissioners voted unanimously to approve a nearly $1 million emergency rent relief program for city residents who have experienced a loss of income due to coronavirus. Online applications will open at 8 a.m. May 4th. 
Lakeland officials were notified April 9th that the city would receive approximately $575,000 in community block development grants under the Federal CARES Act. The city added $350,000 from its existing stream of community development grants and $1,800 from state housing initiative program funds to increase the funding available. Officials say the vast majority of money will go to the emergency rent relief program enough to help 185 to 200 families if limiting each to a maximum of three months rent and or utilities or $5,000. To qualify, applicants must live within Lakeland city limits and be delinquent on their rent or public utilities. City residents must be able to document a loss of income due to COVID-19, such as a job loss, furlough, or reduced working hours. To be in compliance with federal requirements, a household's total income cannot be more than 80% of the area's average median income. Homeowners who are having difficulty paying their mortgage will be able to seek forbearance counseling provided for city residents through the Keystone Challenge Fund. Polk County opened its rental assistance program April 13th and has since received more than 13,500 phone calls seeking assistance, according to Tamara West, the county's housing and neighborhood development manager. Polk has had more than 900 applications for financial assistance. It's good to see that helps out there. Yeah, yeah, and clearly um, it's being utilized. That many, that it's many inquiries a is a lot of, a lot of calls. Yeah. Well. All I can say is hope everything gets better soon. Well, and I'm glad to see that there, you know, there's been a lot of funding out there since this started for small businesses. There's been, uh, you know, mortgage assist, you know, mortgage um, forgiveness or not forgiveness, but you know what I mean. They're, forbearance. Yeah, is that what it's called, forbearance? Um, you know, so it's good to see that there's options out there for folks who are renting as well. Mm -hmm. While the last quarter of their senior year didn't go as planned, High school graduates will still be getting a ceremony. Polk County Public Schools Superintendent Jack Lombard announced that the district will hold graduation ceremonies in June for the district's 5,400 high school seniors. Several school board members said they were happy to hear that the efforts of the county's seniors will be formally applauded. In recent weeks, seniors were given the opportunity to fill out an online poll, choosing between a traditional graduation a drive-through graduation, and an online or virtual graduation. Bird said that 3,700 seniors responded to the poll, with nearly 75% voting in favor of a traditional cap and gown walk across a stage to receive their diploma. One concern has been for the students joining the military who might have to ship out before June. Bird said they have been notified by the U.S. Armed Forces that deployments are being delayed so those students would be able to participate. One of the things I felt the worst about with these kids is that they're missing out. I mean, I have family members who are missing out on prom and everything else, but to take graduation and the celebration of all their achievements away from them too, that was just heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, the, the fact that they're delaying it just a few months is helpful. You know, if you say, oh, well, we're going to have to delay it until December or, or you know, January right. of next year or something like that. I mean, that's that's a little bit different. But the fact that they're that they're planning to be able to do this so soon kind of helps ease the pain a little bit. Absolutely. Polk County teachers finally have a contract. Polk County public schools teachers, paraeducators and support professionals have a new contract after the Polk County School Board voted 6 to 1 to approve the agreement ratified over the past six weeks by union members. Under the old contract, teachers had three self-directed planning periods in a week, one collaborative planning period with their grade level or subject colleagues, and one professional learning community. Principals could also utilize one day for planning. Under the new contract, teachers have four self-directed planning periods in a week, with one principal-directed day to use for collaborative planning, professional learning community, or other data gathering and review. In addition, during shortened weeks, teacher planning remains at four periods. The new contract also protects teacher autonomy in lesson planning. In recent years, principals have had the power to ask for lesson plans in their preferred format, which can differ from administrator to administrator. 
So a teacher with years of experience might have to spend time rewriting lesson plans that have worked for them individually simply to comply with a new format under a new principal. The one thing the contract did not contain that teachers wanted was a raise. An additional $10 million in the district budget went to offset the rising cost of health insurance for employees and covered dependents. Oh, some, good, some good wins in there for the teachers. Yeah, hopefully the raise money will come eventually, but yeah. I know that a lot of them, their most important thing is the time, not the money, and they're, they're getting a little bit of that back. Yeah, yeah, it's not real. It's not real fair that teachers have to come home and spend almost as much time in the evenings grading papers and doing their work at home as they are putting the hours in at the school. So good to see they're getting a little more time during the day to take care of that stuff. Thanks for watching PGTV News. The board review is coming up, but first, a military mom coming home from deployment plans a surprise for her daughter, but little does she know she's in for a surprise of her own. Take a look. I was excited, I was overwhelmed. It was, it was like so many emotions running through my head at the same time. It's so easy to know that you don't have your ID in here. Real quick, I know somebody who may have it. What's going on? Mommy! <laughs> of emotions. It's okay. Did he get you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and they were still recording. She was like, oh. Are they still gonna keep recording? You know, she was talking to my husband in the car, and he was like, "Yeah, you know, we want you to, you know, get, get you seen your home." She was really slick with that, <laughs> cause I was like, "Okay, well, all right, we can do that." I'm a proud Navy. I done a couple of deployments, and I know that feeling you get back home. You just want to be around your family. You just want to be around your close friends and just have a place you can call home and thankful that you are alive because you could have lost your life. Yeah. Serving your country. So much is, is sacrifice. So much is sacrifice. So, so much is lost. Oh, yes. So much time is lost. By the way, first I want to do is give you a tour of the garage for off the backyard. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to get When I came home, just to see everybody just greet me with open arms the way they did, and I was very emotional. I was, I was grateful. I was happy. I didn't even think I had that much support. I'm so proud of her. We wanted her to feel like, hey, this is home. She deserved it. I came home to an actual home, like a place that I can call my own. I was happy. You could be spreading the coronavirus without realizing you have it. So do your part and stay home. It's important to limit in-person interaction with anyone outside of your immediate household, but phone and video chat are safe ways to connect. It's also important to limit social gatherings. If you need essential items like food and medicine, try using a delivery service. If you must leave your house for essential items, or if you wanna take a walk for exercise, make sure to wear a cloth face covering Stay at least six feet away from other people. Try not to touch frequently touch surfaces like light signals, street signs, or benches. And wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds as often as possible. This advice applies to people of any age, including teens and younger adults. 
It takes all of us to slow the spread of the coronavirus. So stay home unless absolutely necessary. Visit coronavirus.gov for the latest information. Welcome to the Board Review with news about your county government. I'm your host, Trisha Pichette. Today you'll learn about County Commission actions from the April 21, 2020 Board Meeting. As social distancing guidelines continue to prevent against the spread of COVID-19, Commissioners kept their one-chair buffer at the dais Tuesday to carry out the business of the Board. The meeting Tuesday began with both good and promising news for the Board. On the upside, the county's auditor, Clifton Larson Allen, presented the board with its findings of the county's finances and financial practices in the comprehensive annual financial audit for the fiscal year that ended September 30th, 2019. The, audi the auditors returned a clear bill of financial health, noting that an unmodified opinion and no material weaknesses were found. One deficiency was noted in the county's time entry approach but that is already being addressed with employees. In the promising category, Tourism and Sports Marketing Director Mark Jackson reported back to the board with updated figures on the financial losses in tourism revenue the county suffered in March. On a positive note, Jackson added that their initial projections for losses were slightly off and the county posted encouraging numbers, albeit at a loss and the losses of canceled events like Sun and Fun, Detroit Tigers spring training and other events were significant. Once the county emerges with the rest of the country from the precautions taken for the coronavirus, Jackson expects the county's tourism to rebound. Already, he and his staff are planning to change venue culture with the addition of new standards for how facilities are cleaned, the use of specific sprayers to target viruses, along with the use of hand sanitizers and greater prevalence of hand washing stations. Up first for items to be approved by the board was the approval of a $27 million loan from TD Bank to finance the cost of the county's upgrade to Oracle, four fire stations, Northeast Regional Park Improvements, the soon-to-be-built Northeast Government Center, and defibrillators. An amendment to a consultant agreement was approved Tuesday with Patel, Green and Associates to provide professional engineering services for the West Pipkin Road widening project. The company's services in this agreement include permitting, final design, bidding support and construction right-of-way support services for nearly $1 million. Currently right-of-way purchases and other land development caused the need for these services. This will allow the company to make modifications to existing stormwater management ponds, design as well as additional U-term accommodations that are needed. The board approved a contract with Tri-County Human Services Tuesday to preserve a vital function of the Helping Hands program. The contract, which is not to exceed $128,150 during the course of a year, will provide forensic intensive case management services for high-need clients. These positions have been funded by a state grant, but all grant programs were halted because of COVID-19 response, and its renewal was not possible. This funding will provide for two employees to continue their work through Tri-County in an effort to continue the services to that program. The board approved the release of a surety in the form of a $63,014 performance bond for Laurel Wood Landings, and in a separate measure, the board also accepted the development's potable water utility system for ownership, operation, and maintenance by the Polk County Utilities. A one-year warranty and surety of about $101,858 was also approved. The board also held several public hearings on a variety of items. Those items up for consideration included a small-scale comprehensive plan amendment and associated ordinance were approved to change the future land use designation on about nine acres from residential medium to community activity center and amend a section in the land development code to reference this case having development standards. This paves the way for the creation of a storage facility 
off Shepherd Road in Lakeland. In a related case for the same property, the board approved a land development text amendment to add development standards. Well, that wraps up this edition of the Board Review. To keep current with programs and progress in the county, visit us online at polk-county.net or follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We encourage you to watch the next scheduled board meeting at 9 a.m. Tuesday, May 5th, 2020. I'm Trisha Pichette, and thank you for watching.